The spotlight is on Hollywood right now as the nominations for the coveted Oscar awards are about to be named. We take you live to Los Angeles for the big announcement. The producer of this year's Oscar telecast, Mr. Quincy Jones. <laughs> First days on a new job are often pretty easy, unless, of course, you're the new mayor of New York City. Mayor Giuliani put in a full first day visiting city employees who have to work on this holiday, and he's at City Hall signing bills and swearing in civil and criminal court judges. He graciously agreed to talk to us from his new office at City Hall, and so we welcome the brand new mayor of New York City, Rudolph Giuliani. Welcome, Mayor Giuliani. Death Defying Acts is aptly titled. It begins with one deadly play, follows up with another that starts lively enough but ends in slow death. And the third and final play in the group is an out-and-out -out killer. Let's begin with that deadly play. It's called An Interview, written by David Mamet, and it is a brief exercise in Mamet dialogue. You know, that halting, herky-jerky style that can drive you crazy. Who would bury a lawnmower? No one I know. But you said it was buried. Hmm. You said... Oh, I said the comment was buried. The comment? Yes. What comment? The thing the man said. It was buried. Yes. What do you mean? But what, I ask, do they mean? Yes. This piece comes off almost as a self-parody. The two actors just sit there, going back and forth, making no sense. And the whole thing ends in a cheap lawyer joke. Mercifully, it dies quickly. The second play, about a desperately suicidal woman trying to phone a suicide hotline, is Elaine May's amusing contribution. Wait a minute, I don't understand. There are five suicide centers in Manhattan and none of them is called the suicide center? Well, listen, no, listen, 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 operator, I want the main suicide center. Linda Lavin, almost unrecognizable in red wig here, does a fine job. She's an amazingly accomplished comedian, as you'll discover in the next play. The problem is that May attempts to stretch this one joke, one act, into far more than it deserves, and by the end, we hope Lavin hurries up and puts herself and the play out of our misery. Then it's Woody Allen's turn with this extended one act called Central Park West. It is clearly the best of the bunch, and it is hilarious in the most warped, sophisticated New York way. This sordid tale of two friends cheating on their spouses is so bitter and biting, it comes off as a comedy version of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Deborah Monk is priceless. She spews Allen's one-liners like a rattlesnake spits venom. One of my patients gagged on a fishbone at Le Bernardin, and a stranger came up behind her and performed the Heimlich maneuver on her, and it aroused her. And now, wherever she dines, she gags. <laughs> Like him or not, Woody Allen is a master comedy writer. Unfortunately, the producers provided very little video of the play, so I'm prevented from showing you the best highlights. But I will just say Allen's play is so accomplished and so well performed, it makes up for the shortcomings of the other two plays. You could just die laughing. I'm Roma Tori, and that's a wrap for New York One. Drinking always goes right to my feet. <laughs> The sisters Rosenzweig energized Broadway this year, becoming our first real hit. And nine months after its March opening, it's still going. Then in late April, out of the West, came this guy. Tommy, can you hear me? Oh, we could hear him all right, and Tommy had that unmistakable sound of a solid smash hit. So did this show. Broadway fell in love with Cheetah Rivera all over again, and all it took was one kiss of the Spider Woman. It went on to win the Tony for Best Musical this year, and its Candor and Ebb music shared the Best Score Tony with Pete Townsend, who penned the Who's Tommy. But of all the shows that opened this year, none was greeted with more enthusiasm than Angels in America. Tony Kushner's seven-hour epic about gay life and AIDS in America seemed heaven-sent, injecting Broadway with another solid hit and some of the freshest writing ever to grace our stages. They will tell you are a homosexual. And I will proceed systematically to destroy your reputation and your practice and your career in New York State, Henry. Which you know I can do. Originality on Broadway these days is almost as elusive as commercial success. We saw 13 revivals open this year. In fact, most of the new shows still running are based on old sources. As for the new crop coming in, obviously the trend is continuing. The nine performers featured in the new Broadway show, Smokey Joe's Cafe, the songs of Lieber and Stoller, must have the best jobs in the city. They get to sing and shimmy, jump and jive magnificently through two hours of pure musical joy. 
I didn't expect much from this standard sounding review, but it is by no means standard. And as reviews go, this one stands out by a Memphis mile. And speaking of Memphis, that city's most famous son sang the praises quite literally of Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. They composed not one, but several of Elvis's most famous songs. And look how cleverly the show's creators paired these two signature numbers. I treat him in a... I treat him in a... You ain't nothing but a hound dog Quit snooping by my door And if there was any doubt that Lieber and Stoller deserved their own show, listen to some of their other classics. I the greyhound back for home They all say One of the great surprises about the production is how tightly it all hangs together, even though it contains no book or overall storyline. But the songs of Lieber and Stoller were in themselves highly dramatic, and even the smaller numbers are mini masterpieces in their own right. The result is a riveting experience that is supremely entertaining. Of course, a large part of the show's success is its brilliant ensemble of performers. B.J. Crosby has a set of lungs that could power a steam locomotive. And Victor Trent Cook, a wonderfully versatile performer who handles humor and heartbreak with equal virtuosity. Patty Darcy Jones, a former backup singer, deserves to be front and center from here on in. With her voice of Janis Joplin and soul of Aretha, she has the power to blow you away. Delee Lively rocks the house with a body and voice made of dynamite. And Brenda Braxton leaves you wanting more, along with the rest of this outstanding cast. Ken Ard, Frederick B. Owens, Michael Park, and Adrian Bailey, their combined energies and talents are inspiring. I can't get you out of my mind. And you, too, won't be able to get this terrific show out of your mind. Special mention to Joey McNeely, whose inventive musical staging is a pure delight. Director Jerry Zachs has done nearly the impossible here. He's taken a show with no book and made it one of the most exciting of the season. Seeing Smokey Joe's Cafe, the songs of Lieber and Stoller, is like getting on a train through rock and roll history. Not just hearing the music, but feeling its blues, its humor, its passion. And when this exhilarating ride is over, I bet you'll want to climb back on for more. I'm Roma Torrey, and that's a wrap for New York One. New York City. This is the place. Excuse me. All right, the story's coming up on the 10 o'clock news. Confirmed the origin of a the bullet that earlier today took the life of an innocent six-year-old boy who was on his way to school during an apparent police action. On the Waterfront is and will forever be one of the greatest movie classics of all time, and for that reason, you have to wonder, why put it on Broadway? Why mess with greatness? After seeing the ambitious stage version, which looked like the film in wide shots only, I have no answers except that renting the video is a lot cheaper and you get the close-ups. It's not that the play stinks. It valiantly attempts to capture the film's dark grittiness. And thanks to some fine performances, appropriate designs, and well-paced direction, it succeeds in recreating the movie to a point. But that's not good enough. In fact, recreation is a big mistake. It forces us to make comparisons, and as good as Ron Eldred is in the lead role of punchy Terry Malloy, who can forget Marlon Brando? Even the I could have been a contender speech is lifted intact, and those now cliche lines hang from his mouth like yesterday's cigarette. I believe in you. If only we could. I've always liked Matthew Broderick. He's a terrific actor in plays. But in this musical role is the ambitious J. Pierpont Finch who manipulates his way from window washer up the corporate ladder. I fear he's taken on more than he can handle. He lacks the vocal and more important physical range to succeed, and he comes off so stiff and awkward, at times seeming to identify more with the office furniture than the moving people next to him. Director Des Mackinoff makes the most of most of his company, but even with a very polished, flashy production and that amazing set that zooms in and out and up and down, how to succeed in business seemed to lack that vital spark of greatness. And despite a game effort on his part, Matthew Broderick made us think of Ferris Bueller more than Robert Morse. I'm Roma Torrey, and that's a wrap for New York One.